So uh, Ryan and I were talking um, for the uh, pre-meeting for this. One of the topics that came up was uh, the current state of EMS within Lewis County. And what you see in this picture right here is actually something that uh, I'm quite proud of. Um, this was facilitated by Lewis County Search and Rescue, which is the largest agency in Lewis County. What you see in front of you is a picture that represents almost every single EMS agency in the county. There are two missing. Uh, West Lyden was not available, but this picture in turn was not available. LSR did the courtesy of backfilling the uh, areas so that this uh, picture could be taken. That should put a uh, punctuation mark on the uh, unity that w is within this county as far as uh, EMS goes. We have to be a tight group because we're a small group. I did a census back in 2012 and we had uh, 112 providers countywide. That's from basic EMT to advanced providers. Um, pretty much you'll see a crescendo, descendo type thing uh, with the EMS and that it'll go up and down. Uh, what I've seen recently is that it's been going progressively down. Uh, 2019 census, we have in the high 80s for the number of providers. So that number is going down. Um, one of the things that we did recently is I had uh, the REMSCO, the Regional EMS Council Chair, came down to uh, my office. And she said, what do you think the state of EMS is within your county? And I said, well, I said, I think it's pretty good. <coughs> She goes, and then she started naming off agencies one by one, and she said, so tell me how strong are they? I said, well, they're strong. And then she said, what about this agency? Are they strong? Yeah, yeah, they're good and strong. They always get out the door. They do a great job. And then she said to me something that was quite sobering to me that I never thought of before. She said, what if they lose one or two people? And the color came out of me, because it was then that I realized that it's one or two people that is making that agency strong. So, what are we doing about it? We're encouraging people. We're trying to say, hey, come on, let's be a volunteer EMT. Come on, help service your communities. And we're doing a fair job at backfilling these, uh, there are, you know, the agencies as far as the number of providers you get. Uh, there are eight total ambulance agencies within this county, uh, with Search and Rescue being the only one that's uh, got some partially paid staff. So, what's going on? This is what's going on. And this isn't a bad thing. Education is not a bad thing at all. In fact, I, uh, I, I think that uh, Lewis County and the counties that are surrounding are a role model for uh, having good, sound uh, EMTs. In fact, I'll put our basic EMTs against any in the state. They're some of the best qualified, some of the smartest, and some of the best at making clinical decisions. <coughs> but if you can see up here on the board, this works. No, it was not the center right. one. The center one? So this is an EMR, an emergency medical responder, of which there are no agencies within Lewis County that uh, have EMRs. And the reason for that is, is because the ones that do have ambulances need EMTs, not emergency medical responders. The only EMR agency that comes into this county is Redfield, out of Oswego County that covers uh, uh, um, the uh, Osceola area. So we go with uh, EMTs. So EMTs, just to take the class, is an estimated 150 to 190 hours. This is where we start to lose them. We bring them in, we say, hey, come on down, be an EMT. Oh, by the way, you gotta spend two nights a week away from your family for about, uh, I don't know, four to six months. And that was, that was, we try to move them up the ladder and you cannot go anywhere without becoming an EMT first. So we try to go to uh, intermediate. That's 160 to 200 hours. We used to have a level called critical care EMT or advanced EMT or a level three is what we used to refer to them around here. That's gone, that's gone away. Uh, those, of, those of them who were critical care EMTs can remain critical care EMTs. So the only other choice you have from there is paramedic. That's 1,000 to 1,200 hours, okay? That's not too bad either. I mean, it's doable, but I wanna be clear about this. This is not licensure. This is a certification, so every three years, guess what you get to do? Recertify. <coughs> so now we're gonna go with more hours. Oh, yeah, that's just the class time for those classes. Now we'll go for clinical times. For the BLS, uh, CFR, or EMTs, 12 hours of ambulance ride time, 10 hours of emergency room time, ICS, uh, introduction to hazmat, 
uh, another NIMS course that you have to take. And then you start getting into advanced EMTs, 24 hours ambulance ride time, 12 hours hospital time, and then the paramedics. Uh, by the way, these are minimums. Um, an additional 48 hours, you gotta go through stages, one, two, and three, where you're just an observation, and then you're your assistant, and then you become team leader. Uh, 24 hours additional hospital time plus, that's in addition to the 12 hours of hospital time, you got eight hours ICU time, uh, burn unit time, three hours dispatch, one elective, and OR time where you have to uh, actually intubate patients. So that's just for the training. Now, what do you do? I don't expect you to read that because that's, uh, that's one of uh, the, the full pods of uh, doing PowerPoint presentations. That'll just give you some idea. To sum this up for you, basically, if you're an advanced EMT or paramedic, you, are neuro you have the, some qualifications as a neurologist, you have some qualifications as a cardiologist, and of course there's orthopedic injuries. And even the basic EMT is very good at recognizing and identifying orthopedic injuries in the field. So you go from everything from, uh, from uh, people that are having respiratory problems, whether it's from asthma or from COPD, um, and then you have to recognize how to treat that patient. You've got diabetic reactions, allergic reactions, <coughs> seizures, poisoning, behavioral emergencies. Um, all of these things need to be addressed. So medications you're giving in the field uh, as a basic is nitro, uh, epinephrine auto injectors, which by the way now is uh, actually drawing up in a syringe, um, hand, handheld aerosol inhalers, so on and so forth. So it really is quite a bit to uh, have on your plate and to volunteer to do that. You, um, and it really is uh, quite a bit. Every three years you would have to recertify and you have to get at least 24 hours of additional time as well as go to classes and so on and so forth. So for uh, paramedics, uh, which is the highest level, what do they do? Advanced cardiology, arrhythmia, arrhythmia recognition, um, pharmacologic interventions, so that means you have to treat them with a medication to uh, alter that particular uh, rhythm that their heart is in. Uh, management of hemodynamically unstable patients, which means that there is shock. Hypoglycemic and hypoglycemic patients, uh, those are the diabetics, cardiac arrest, ACLS, pediat uh, pediatric medical, um, advanced life support. Oh, by the way, those are the exact same ones that the RNs take at Lewis County General Hospital and all the other hospitals. In fact, there's actually some paramedics that teach this class because they're more efficient at doing it and had the actual time to, to actually put into learning and teaching the class. It's nothing against them. They actually do an outstanding job and I'm sure that there are some excellent qualified RNs that would definitely be able to teach this class and do teach this class. But typically, you'll get a paramedic that'll teach it because they do it a lot in the field. Uh, seizure patient management, uh, complicated childbirth, and neonatal resuscitation. So these are just some of the things that uh, paramedics do in the field or are qualified to do in the field. Fortunately, the last one we don't do too often. So you just drop at the hospital and go, right? Nope. Gone are the days of the paper, paper PCR, which you used to fill out on the way there. Now we've got regional mandates for electronic PCRs. This is added a half hour to two hours to every ambulance call. So once you get done delivering the patient to the hospital, after you treated them, after you've gone back, you've got to sit there for an hour and a half to two hours to do a PCR. You have to clean and restock the rig after the call. You don't just go home and go eat and go be with your family. You have to maintain that confidential paperwork. Um, billing paperwork, if uh, applicable. Oh yeah, the, um, the fundraising, because you still have to be part of your department and try to make more money. So this thought summarizes this right here. The average fire calls are 12 to one for, for EMS calls. So for every 12 EMS calls, there's one fire call. They are, we are busy within the county. Um, and they, we respond to just about everything. And one of the things that a lot of people overlook is this element right here, which is community education. We will go out to communities and we will sponsor uh, CPR courses. We'll support you with CPR courses. Um, what you see down here in the corner, that's, uh, that's my ugly mug right there with a retired dispatcher. She used to be a basic EMT. By the way, show of hands, who used to be a basic EMT in the room? Okay, what about an advanced EMT? Why, why'd you get out of it? Got burnout on it. 
Got burnout? 13 up. 13 okay. and you're moving on. Yep. Kip? Got tired. Got tired? Yep. What about you, Gary? <laughs> same, same thing. Same? Same? Yep. Nine years worth of calls and stuff like that. We yep. Had enough. Yeah, and I wasn't trying to call anybody out, by the way. I was just trying to get a get a get a feel for where everybody's at. Um, and I will tell you the statistics on EMS providers. Typically, they last three to five years in the industry. So once you get them, they get certified, then they move along. Uh, typically, because they realize that the recertification process is so lengthy. And it's not of anybody's fault, it's certainly not the state's fault, because I wouldn't want somebody who wasn't adequately qualified working on me. But nevertheless, that time that it takes away from your family and actually, uh, actually getting the certifications, and there are actually some agencies, and hear me when I say this, there are actually some agencies that won't help you with getting your recertification. You pay for it out of your own pocket. Or you have a fundraiser so that you can go to that conference so you can get those CME hours. So you, by the way, CME is continuing medical education. So you can go to those conferences so you can stay certified to provide the service for your community. They say, okay, go raise your own money. Go have a chicken barbecue. Go sell something, have a fundraiser. Does this make sense to anybody? Didn't to me either. But I got that brought to my attention by another agency within this county that told me that. Made me quite angry, but it is what it is. They were willing to do it, they actually did do it, and they sent their folks to class. So, that's a little overview on what's going on within the county. How do we fix it? I don't know. All I can do is keep doing what I've been doing, which is try to encourage people. That's my attempt at humor. <laughs> Those of us who've worked with Jim Beavers over the years. Yeah, there's, there's a few of us in the room that have worked with Jim Beavers. Uh, and by the way, Jim Devers is retired completely. He's no longer a paramedic as well, but he is actually still driving for LSR and he's doing a great job and he is doing great. <coughs> so I don't have a magic, uh, I don't have a magic fix for this, but what I do, what, what I will offer is I still go out within the communities, every event that I'm invited to, I still, you know, try to encourage people to join the fire service, to j uh, join EMS and to get involved with their communities. And when I go out to these, uh, these um, uh, when I'm invited, I should say, to come do these presentations, I'm not really hyper-focused on one thing. I tell people to go out and, and volunteer within their communities, and I don't care if they do that as an EMS provider, in the fire service, or if they volunteer at their local library. Just go out and volunteer and be part of your community. The feeling that it gives you is pretty darn good. But for today, this is what I have to give you, and unfortunately, um, it sounds like a bunch of doom and gloom, but we are actively trying to encourage folks to uh, join the fire service and the EMS as well. Um, there are uh, classes going on continuously. Uh, if anybody's got any questions or knows anybody who may be interested in becoming an EMT or joining the fire service, please contact me, please. I can hook you up with your local agency, and I can encourage them or encourage you to go visit them and go see what they have. And for those of you in the room who have not been to your local fire station recently, go down there, have a talk with them, see where they're at, find out their, find out their stability within your community and uh, see where they're at. How many volunteers do they have? How many calls do they do a year? Am I doing my part? I'm doing the best I can. I'm, I'm doing what I can every day for the county. And uh, I was out at a structure fire this morning and doing my thing, but um, I do about 200 volunteer EMS calls a year as an advanced care provider, as a paramedic. So that means I hook up with Turin, Constableville, West Leiden, Port Leiden, pretty much the southern end of the county. I do what I can with the time that I have. And that's, uh, that's pretty much what everybody does. They give the time that they have and they give the time that they can possibly give. I wasn't, by the way, that wasn't anything to showboat or anything like that. I'm just telling you the, the facts the way they are. Bob, uh, you said we're at mid 80s at this point with numbers. A couple right. years ago we were at 120. What's the, the number that we start getting really <coughs> concerned? About 100. So we're below that already. We're below that already. When I was at 112, I was nervous. Um, and at that time,
time we were trying to encourage more people to join, uh, you know, fire service or become engaged in their local EMS agency. Um, there really is no silver bullet for this. The stability of some of these agencies literally is that shaky. One or two providers. We are starting to uh, keep track of ambulance agencies as far as uh, scrub calls or calls that they that they flip to other agencies or miss within their communities. And we're, we're keeping those agencies on the radar. And it's not to be mean to them, it's not to take them out of service or anything like that. It's just, just to have an increased awareness so we can see what tools they may possibly need to encourage more involvement in, in within the communities. One of the things that you'll find with EMS and with the fire service is generational. I'm sure that if you go out and talk to any EMS provider, they're gonna say, yeah, the reason I got into it is because my uncle did it, my brother did it. You know, it, um, it was um, my mother did it for a while, my father did it. And I can see that within my own family. My wife's a basic EMT, my oldest daughter's a basic EMT, my youngest daughter has completed the basic EMT class. She's on her way. It is a generational thing, and it, it, it truly is, it, uh, it's, it's cultural. It becomes a part of you. You feel honored to be able to service your community. So if it, anybody have any questions for me, please, I, I encourage you to ask me questions. I wish I had a silver bullet to say, this is the answer, and this is what we need to do, but I don't have that. Not to point fingers, just an area in the county that's in worse shape now, relatively speaking, than the other areas. Far north and far south. <coughs> Some of the other agencies that come into our county, uh, up in the north, uh, northern uh, Natural Bridge covers an area within Lewis County. Um, I had already mentioned the Osceola area, Camden Ambulance out of Oneida County covers that area. Uh, Boonville Ambulance covers a portion in southern Lewis County, and Carthage Ambulance covers a little finger in the northern end of Lewis County as well. So those are additional agencies that assist Lewis County uh, in meeting their needs with uh, the community. What do you mean? Oh, sorry, I'm back. No, I was just going to scroll back to my original uh, slide. This right here. I, I actually agonized whether I was going to put that on there or not, but the truth of the matter is I needed to put that on there. Because one of the things that I've noticed over the years and one of the things that I've discovered since I got into EMS is that we stink at marketing ourselves. We're terrible at it. The community has no idea what we do. They're like, we're going to call 911, an ambulance shows up, and that's the way it is. They really don't know all of the things that go on in the back of an ambulance. And they don't know the, other, the, the, the things that we can do. You know, taking, taking a patient to the local facility in Lewis County General is usually, you know, it sounds like what we're going to do. It's not what we're going to do in, in some cases. In some cases, if you're having a stroke or if you're having a cardiac event, you need to go to a stroke center and you need to go to a cardiac center. So you don't go to Lewis County General, especially if you're in the southern end of the county. You will be going directly to St. Luke's if you're having a stroke or you'll be going directly to St. Elizabeth's if you're having a heart, a heart event because the St. Saint, St. Uh, Saint Elizabeth's is our cardiac hospital, and St. Luke's is our stroke center. If not, you may be earning yourself a helicopter ride, in which case we, uh, I won't get into the costs and the uh, amount of manpower associated with <coughs> it, because now you've got to pay down an additional fire department as well as the ambulance service. But you've also wasted critical time. So it is, indeed. And, <coughs> and, and, and once again, it's more time away from the family, or a group of people now going away from their family as well. So There's, there is no silver bullet. Bob and I have been looking, at, you know, keeping track of the scrub rates, which is when you get a call and your, and your agency doesn't respond. Especially if your agency tells dispatch that you're available. And there are a few in the county that claim to be available more than they actually are. I think if we, you know, keep losing providers, I'm not saying it's our responsibility, it's not really the county's responsibility, but the towns need to be made aware that the people that they're contracting with maybe aren't getting the job done. And at that point, we would hopefully ask the legislators for some support um, to go back to your towns and, and have a frank conversation. So we do keep track of those things, Bob, you know, Bob gives me the data. Well, and it's also, you know, <coughs> trying to operate it's a hell of a lot nicer to have seven EMTs than the chances of having one around town when the fire sign goes off 
is a hell of a lot better than having one and two, mm -hmm. especially working. But on the same aspect, it should be the responsibility of these agencies to be discussing that with the town and see what options working together can provide, whether it's bringing in a paid service, whether it's forming another search and rescue in the southern and northern part, where all the towns and villages contribute to have somebody there and help out, still do it mm -hmm. with the volunteers they want. But, you know, a lot of people just think if we cut one or two, we're going to be able to manage that. And if you read your contract, it says you will respond within a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. So, whether you want to have a prank crew in your town or not, somebody might do it for you when you start playing these games. It's serious. And I, I've actually heard that thrown around a lot, and I've actually had the discussions with the towns and villages as well as uh, the ambulance agencies. I shouldn't say towns and villages, I should say uh, town and village officials, as well as the ambulance agencies. And you, you know, you, you're mentioning, you know, getting together and forming an agency in the south. Uh, one of the one of the one of the caveats to that is that you would probably have to have some type of paid staff there. Um, and there, and I've done the math on this, and I've done, I've crunched the numbers on this, and, it, and <coughs> unless there's a significant increase in revenue from towns and villages, which nobody will even recognize, um, the, the the chances of that existing are virtually none because it's not, it would not be self-sustaining mm -hmm. under the building. I, I agree with what you're saying, but if the towns and villages want the EMS, then they're going to need to kick in. That's the bottom line. Yeah, uh, indeed. And an, inter an, an interesting little side note is, uh, and I'm going to say this because there's a lot of people who don't like me to say this, EMS is a non-mandated service. What does a non-mandated service mean? You dial 911, they have to send you law enforcement if someone's breaking in your house or if something's been stolen from your house. If you dial 911 and say my house is burning, they have to send you a fire department. If you dial 9, it's a non-mandated service. If you dial 911 and say I need an ambulance, they do not have to send you an ambulance. It's a non-mandated service. Because, you know, if they would combine forces, mm -hmm. and I know we all like our territory and different stuff like this, but it would be easier on everybody involved. I mean, pick a central location. Some are going to be, you know, and I'm not advocating. I'm not getting into that. But, you know, some are going to be farther from others. But think about it. How do you respond if you have someone saying they can respond just soon as that call comes in? More than likely, you're going to make as good a time going seven miles to a location to get the person as the people getting in their vehicles, cleaning them off, and getting to the fire and stuff. And if you can somehow form a central one, and I'm not meaning to take away from anything. That's not it, because everybody that does EMS and this and that, it's kind of the town's identities. But if we keep going like we're going, everybody trying to do it, I just don't think we can sustain it. It's got to be the towns that they believe in. They pay for the paid people and stuff. And, you know, like, say you take the southern part, if that form like that. I mean, the bottom line, you pick a central location, <coughs> and yeah, some people, while it's not in town, they are going to be some here and there. But you know there's, say, a paramedic, this one and that one. You can respond to at least three out of there because you've got the qualified people or two and back it up so you stand a chance of coming in. <coughs> and the way we're at now, I mean, it's probably, I'll speak from Baltimore like ours. One of them's out in the woods cutting. Well, if I hear the call go off, I can get out with my skitter and trees and turn around get to the firehouse and this and that, and we don't call in. If you're not going to be there, you're out of town. You really should call in because it's not fair to the people in town. So, mm -hmm. I mean, whatever we can do, you know, at least I mm -hmm. can do. I'll gladly. I think the, I think the biggest um, ask for this group is to just raise awareness in your, within your municipalities mm -hmm. that, that you service so that they have some awareness at that, that this is, you know, at this point, go visit those local agencies, find out what their needs are, find out what their what their budgets are and what their staffing models are, and uh, see if there's anything, you know, that, that you can do to help facilitate additional conversation 
between uh, those agencies and the municipalities that they serve. Um, before they renew a contract, call <coughs> Bob and look at the scrub rate. Because, <coughs> frankly, some of our towns are not getting a very good deal right now. Well, and it's also important, and I, I can't always <coughs> emphasize this enough. You know me, I'm going to raise my volunteer flag. It's also important to note that even though it may not appear that way, they are in fact doing the best they can. Because, oh, I like I say, yeah. because of the, 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 the staffing levels that they're currently at, are they trying? Yep, they're trying. They definitely are, but on the same aspect, that's not quite adequate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I guess the thing is, is that do you kind of hang it out halfway or do you be honest? I mean, you know, a prime example, we talked about going to LS between us and eight. And having one person in there because we were down to one man too. And um, Ava and Tom, Tom Lewis agreed that they would pay each $45,000 a year for the person there. We had to furnish the ambulance. Mm -hmm. And then our stuff started picking back up again. Mm -hmm. But if you took that money that you're looking like that and divided between the five, it would be a hell of a lot more power. And the calls were based on. I don't think anybody would be excluded no. by doing that. No, I agree. No. But it's, you know, it's like me going to the town board and being a fireman, bringing that up and half the board's fireman. <coughs> That's like a red balloon, too. Mm -hmm. You know, for sure. So. Our town is only interested in numbers. How many times did they do that? Whether it's fire or anything else. I think they need some education. I don't disagree with that. <coughs> and like I said before, shame on me. You know, I, well, I'm, no, I'm part of the I'm part of that marketing problem. It's not shame on you, but but I, I think the biggest. So they have to use it. Mm -hmm. They don't know what they're missing. Yeah. The biggest thing is mm -hmm. everybody wants theirs, and it's hard for anybody to give anything up and share. And I understand that fully. But I think, you know, if the state would go back to the structure that they used to have 20 years ago, where it was basic EMT and head level ones and twos and threes and paramedic was four, you could drop back to the 80 hours for basic EMT, which provided, you know, for basic care. Um, you'd have a lot more volunteers than when it takes 20, 50 to 200 hours to get basic care. I, I, I agree uh, in theory with what you're saying, but um, as it stands right now, I've never seen a reverse the decision on anything, so we're pretty much stuck with the model of what. The other thing they did was, you know, when they regionalized <coughs> care, where you used to, you could plan on going to Wildville and dropping the patient off, and, you know, we could, uh, we could do a run in under two hours from my thought. Mm -hmm. Now you get an ambulance, you don't know if you're going to Utica, Syracuse, or where you're going, <coughs> and all of a sudden the one call <coughs> turned into almost all day. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and and I can I can tell you from from you know, I can tell you from personal experience, Lions Falls Ambulance has been to SUNY Upstate and Syracuse a couple of times at least this year, and it's actually been to Strong in Rochester before. And because that's, that's what the service demands. That's a huge difference in time. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I understand you know, the golden hour mm -hmm. and all that stuff, but you know, it's just you know, the part of the straw that breaks the camel's back. Yep. And that's what I'm trying to avoid, is breaking that camel's back. Well, it's something Bob and I talked about, so we wanted to give you guys a chance to get a little understanding about our 